Now we're there in Proverbs chapter number 31, and today I want us to look at the subject of biblical motherhood. Biblical motherhood, that's the title of the sermon, biblical motherhood. Proverbs is often associated with Solomon. When you, th- when you hear the, the, the name Proverbs, we often think of Solomon. And one of the reasons for that is if you keep your finger in Proverbs chapter number 31, but look at the very first verse of Proverbs, look at Proverbs chapter number 1 and verse number 1. Proverbs chapter number 1 and verse number 1, it says, The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction to perceive the words of understanding. And so what we can see is that Proverbs is a book that was written to impart wisdom. That's what it was for. And Solomon, he was someone who was given more wisdom than anyone had ever had before. Now, thankfully for us, Solomon recorded that wisdom. He recorded that wisdom in this book. So guess what? You know, we don't have to have the wisdom that Solomon was given because we can actually go and look and we can find it there. It's actually written down there and preserved for us today. Now, sadly for Solomon, he didn't actually always follow the wisdom that he had. You know, he was a sinner and he made plenty of mistakes just like we make plenty of mistakes. But Solomon is not the only person who contributed to the wisdom that we find in the book of Proverbs. Obviously, ultimately, the book of Proverbs comes from God. We know the Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. That's where it comes from. You know, it says prophecy came not in the old time by the will of man. It says, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. There's many places we could turn to in the Bible which show us that it's actually men who are speaking God's words. It wasn't their own words. You know, I mean, David, the sweet psalmist of Israel, it says, David, speaking by the Holy Ghost, he said various things that he said, okay? And so we know it's God's word. But, I suppose, if you think about it, there were actually human authors that it came through. And when you think of Proverbs, you tend to think of Solomon. But even within the book of Proverbs, there were other authors whose words were recorded. If you turn back to Proverbs 31 again, Proverbs chapter number 31, actually look at Proverbs chapter number 30, on just across the page here. Proverbs chapter 30, verse number 1, says... The words of Agur, the son of Jakey. So notice that. The words of Agur, the son of Jakey. Or look at the chapter that we've just read. Proverbs chapter number 31. It says, The words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. Now, King Lemuel is believed to be another name for Solomon. But look at whose words he is actually conveying. It says, The words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. You see, his mother taught him some stuff. Solomon got great wisdom. And including some of these some of these words we find recorded in the book of Proverbs, was it was a prophecy that it came from his mother. This is what his mother taught him. Look there, look if you were there in um, verse number one. It says, "The words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him, what my son, and what the son of my womb, and what the son of my vows, give not thy strength unto women, and thy ways to them." To, to that which destroyeth kings. And it's not for kings, O Lemuel. It's not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. So we can see here that Solomon, he was taught by his mother. He was taught by his mother. And what are the first two things that she says to him? She actually says, well, look out for women and look out for wine. Those are the two first warnings that she gives here. Beware of woman and beware of wine. You say, why would his mother be saying beware of woman? Well, I suppose maybe it was a, the wrong sort of woman, a bad woman, can actually destroy your life. Can actually destroy your life. I mean, we, didn't we sing about it before? We sang about it before in Proverbs chapter number 7. We, 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 we sang about this woman, you know, the, 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 the strange woman, the woman with the attire of a harlot, subtle of heart, she's loud and stubborn, her feet abide not in her house. And, and we saw the warning, you know, the young man who was led astray by her and get ready, you know, the, her steps go down to death, you know, she's going down to hell, it's leading to a very, very bad outcome, okay, and so we can see from that, that look, one of the things that, that Solomon's mother warned him about is, look, beware of women, beware, because that can take you down the wrong path, and notice also, um, give not thy strength to women, that's plural, Solomon could have done with listening to that, couldn't he, he could have done with listening to that, because it's look, guess what, the thing about women is, you know, it's okay to have one woman, it's okay to have you know, the Bible says marriage is honour and all and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. And so the warning is there. It's okay to have one woman. Make sure it's a good one. You know, not someone who's loud and stubborn. I mean, the Bible talks about the opposite of that. You know, in, in um, I believe it's First Peter chapter number 3, it talks about how, you know, uh, the opposite of loud and stubborn is with a mild and gentle spirit. That's what it's supposed to be. That's what it's supposed to be like. That's what Sarah was. It was an example of that with Sarah and Abraham. Okay, so she is telling, she's telling Solomon, look, 
you need to beware of women. But the second thing she says, beware of women, but also beware of wine. Beware of wine. Look what it says in verse number four. It says, it is not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink. Why? Why is it that, that kings or princes shouldn't be drinking wine and they shouldn't be drinking strong drink? Here's the reason. Lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. And so here what we see here, she's saying, look, she's, she's telling, look, beware, you shouldn't be drinking alcohol. And once again, alcohol, just like the wrong woman or wrong plural woman, is something that can destroy your life. Alcohol can destroy your life. And that's what he's being warned about by his mother. You know, now, I'm, it's, it's a, you say, well, surely this is just something that applies to Solomon. Because she says, look, it's not for kings, you know, it's not for princes, because she probably told him this when he was young, when he was still just a prince. She says, look, you know, but that's only applying for him. But no, the Bible actually says that God has made us kings and priests under God and his father. In fact, actually, that's another warning it talks about back in Leviticus chapter number 10. In Leviticus chapter number 10, verse number 9, um, Aaron the priest was told by God, he said, Do not drink wine, nor strong drink, thou, nor thy sons' sons with thee, when you go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. God says, don't drink wine, don't drink strong drink, don't drink alcohol. Why? Lest ye die. He says, it shall be a statute forever throughout your generations, that ye may put difference between holy and unholy, and between unclean and clean. And so you say, why is it that someone shouldn't be drinking alcohol? Because then they can't tell what's right and wrong. They can't tell the difference between holy and unholy, between unclean and clean. And look at what it says here in Proverbs chapter number 31. It's not for kings, O Lemuel, it's not for kings to drink wine or princes strong drink, lest they drink and forget the law, and pervert the judgment of any, any afflicted. In other words, they can't tell what's right, and they can't tell what's wrong. I've heard people say that it's just like, oh, well, it's only in this, only... Kings and princes are only not supposed to drink wine when they're sitting in the judgment seat. Well, what about the first half of the verse? Lest they drink and forget the law. When do you want to forget God's law? Is there any time that you want to forget God's law? We should, we should you know, the, Bible, the psalmist says, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. We need God's word, we need God's law in our hearts all the time. We never want to forget it, you know? In fact, earlier on in the book of Proverbs, it says how it's going to guide you. It's going to keep you when you're asleep. When you're awake, it's going to talk with you. Unless, of course, before you went to sleep, you were, you're knocking back some wine or some, you know, strong drink. Then it's probably not. There's probably going to be something else that's going to be talking to you. And so, you know, we need to be aware that, look, beware of women and beware of wine. Now, it's interesting, the next couple of verses, because some people use these next couple of verses where it says, um, after saying, don't drink wine, don't do this, you don't want to forget the law, pervert the judgment. Then it says in verse 6, Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish, and wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. Let him drink and forget his poverty, and remember his misery no more. Now some people use this to say, well then drinking in moderation is okay. Drinking in moderation is fine, because all you need to do is look, it says, look, give strong drink to him that is ready to perish, to those that's got a heavy heart. So if someone's a d depressed, you know, then it's fine for them to have a drink. You know, it might perk them up, might make them feel a bit better. But is that really the case? I mean, who knows anyone that's depressed? Who knows anyone that's depressed? Do you know someone that's feeling down? You're probably, okay, so do you think you should pop off to the local bottle store, buy a bottle of grog and go and take it to them? Is that, is that what God's telling you to do? Because I mean, if that's what, you, you know, or do you think this is being sarcastic? I think Solomon's mother was telling, this was sarcasm. He's saying, look, it's, this is not for you. This is, this is for the person who's down in the gutter. And, you know, if you're down, if you're depressed, if you're in this sort of state, is that actually going to do you any good? It's not. You know, it's like the same people that use the same thing where they, where they say, you know, Timothy, Paul told Timothy, take a little wine for thy stomach's sake, that often infirmities. Oh, alcohol, that's what you need. Look, grow a brain. Alcohol is not good for you. It doesn't help your gut. You know, you drink a lot of alcohol, well, you'll get a big gut, but you might also get, you know, you get bowel cancer, you get all sorts of stuff because it's bad for you. It doesn't help you at all. You say, oh, but I've, I've read these studies, these, these scientific studies, and they show all the good things that you can find, you know, when you're, drink, when you're drinking, um, you know, red wine and stuff. Well, guess what? The same stuff's in grape juice, minus the alcohol, you know? So, be, be, I mean, it's, it's an important thing. She warns them, beware of women and beware of alcohol. Now, just look at this couple more verses before we get into the main topic. Verse number eight, it says, Open thy mouth for the dumb, and the cause of all such as are appointed destruction. Open thy mouth, Judge righteously, so he better not be drinking, and plead the cause of the poor and needy. It's saying, look, open your mouth and speak out against injustice. It's a good thing to speak out 
when people are doing things that are wrong. Speaking out, I mean, the day we live in today, speaking out against tyranny. It's a good thing to say, hey, look, no, this is not right. I'm not going to go along with what you, with what you say we should be doing. You know, so was it the, the, the hairdresser over in Texas who went, went to prison? What did she go to prison for? Why? Because she kept her hairdressing salon open. She says, yes, you can still come in and you get your hair cut. You can pay me and I'll cut your hair. And she was taking precautions and stuff. She was doing things, you know, following this sort of distancing and frantically washing hands and doing all that sort of stuff. But no, arrested, taken to court, and the judge said, no, off to jail, off to jail you go. You know? And this is, this is in the States. In the States where they're actually thinking, whoa, you know, it's too big a risk. There's too many people in prison. So actually, they're releasing people from prison because they don't want the danger overcrowding. But no, if you're going to, you know, cut someone's hair and get paid for it to put fa- food on the, on the table to feed your family, off to prison you go, you know? It's right to speak out and say, no, that, that's wrong, you know? And the judge, I, mean, I saw the video of it, the judge wanted her to apologise. That was why he was so angry. You've got to apologise and admit you're wrong. And she's like, no, I'm not going to. She said, because I'd do the same thing again, you know? She, and and, and that's, that's the right thing. That's the right thing to do. It's, it's, it's the right thing to speak out against oppression. She says, look, open my mouth. For people that can't speak out, because a lot of people who can't speak out, what about speak out against, what about going and protesting about abortion? You know, that, that's someone who can't speak for themselves. He says, look, open thy mouth. Open thy mouth for the dumb and the cause of all such are appointed destruction. Hey, there's some people they can't speak. They're appointed for destruction. Open your mouth and speak out in that. Anyway, let's, let's go on to the topic of today's sermon. Verse number 10. It says, Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. Who can find a virtuous woman? The topic of today's sermon is biblical motherhood. You say, but hang on. That is just talking about being a virtuous woman. Well, one of the things we need to realize is that part of being a woman, being a woman is just intimately linked with being a mother. You see, now not everybody is a mother, but look, everybody has a mother. Everybody, every single person has a mother. And it's, it's I mean, you can go back to the very first man and the very first woman, go back to Adam and Eve. What was, why was Eve called Eve? Eve was called Eve in Genesis chapter number 3 and verse number 20. It says, Adam called his wife named Eve because she was the mother of all living. That's what her name was. She was called Eve because she was the mother of all living. Actually, turn if you were to 1 Timothy chapter number 5. Keep your finger in Proverbs. But turn to 1 Timothy chapter number 5. 1 Timothy chapter number 5. You see, motherhood is a very important concept that we find throughout the Bible. 1 Timothy chapter number 5. 1 Timothy chapter number 5 and verse number 9. 1 Timothy chapter number 5 and verse number 9. And in this, in this, um, in this chapter, he's actually, in fact, we'll start at verse number 1. He, he gives instructions for how people are supposed to behave. He says in, in verse number 1, he says, Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father, the younger men as brethren, the older women as mothers, the younger as sisters, with all purity. Honour widows that are widows indeed. But if any widow have children or nephews, let them learn first to show piety at home and to require their parents, for that is good and acceptable before God. So you say, this is how you're supposed to treat people who are older than you. you know, older men in the church, older women in the church, younger men, younger women. This is how you're supposed to behave towards them. And it says, if someone's a widow, in other words, if, they, if, they, if their husband's died, then and if she's got children or nephews, let them look after her so the church is not... Um, the church is not burdened having to support. Because in those days, there was no you know, social welfare and stuff. And so the church would provide for those people that had need. It says, Now, she that is a widow indeed and desolate trusteth in God and continueth in supplications and prayers night and day. But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. And these things give in charge that they may be blamed. He says, look, this is how you're supposed to behave. This is what widows are supposed to be doing. They're supposed to be you know, faithful, praying to God. And then he says, but if any provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. He says, look, so, so if a man's not going to, the Bible says elsewhere, if a man will not work, neither should he eat. A man is supposed to provide for his household. And if someone doesn't, he's worse than an unbeliever. He says he's worse than an infidel. And that actually that shows how wrong it is what they're doing today, where they're preventing people from working. They're preventing people from providing for their families. And if you do, then we'll lock you up. He says, um, verse number nine, let not a widow be taken into the number under three score years old, having been the wife of one man, well reported of for good works. If she have brought up children, if she have lodged strangers, if she have washed the saints' feet, if she have relieved the afflicted, if she have diligently followed every good work. So this is talking about, remember we said before that the, if, if, they've got, if a widow's got children, if they've got nephews, let them look after them. But if they don't have those, the church will look after them. But it says, but make sure, you know, she's not some sort of slacker widow. She needs to be someone who's actually, you know, has actually done good works. 
and it gives, lists them. And some of the good works it says is, look, if she's brought up children, it's a good work to bring up children. If she's lodged strangers, she's washed the saints' feet. So it's saying, this is not just charity that's dished out to everybody. It's, it's for people that are, that, that are actually you know, living in a godly and righteous way. Look down at verse number, um, uh, verse, number, verse number 14. Look at verse number 14. It says, I will therefore that the younger woman marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. And so once, once again, that's sort of saying that if someone is a, was a, like a, a, a younger widow as opposed to an older one, she should just you know, marry and keep on having children. You know, that's what he says. I will therefore that the young woman marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. And so the, the emphasis we see on the Bible is that what a woman's supposed to do? They're supposed to get married. They're supposed to have children. They're supposed to be mothers. They're supposed to raise a family. That is the ideal. Now, I realize people have different situations and that's not the way it always works out. And we'll get into that in a minute. The other alternatives that there can be. But look, we need to understand just because circumstances might be different in your life, don't ever backtrack from what God says is best. Don't ever backtrack from what God says is best, okay? And there's, there's, a, there's a real tendency today to say, well, they look at some exceptional circumstance and therefore say, okay, so therefore that's just, that's just normal, that's just fine. No, there is, a, there is an ideal way. But guess what? There is an ideal family. An ideal family has got a mother, has got a father, and has got children. It's not ideal to just have a father. It's not ideal to just have a mother. You know, it's not ideal to have broken families and mixed families. That, that's not the way that it should be. That's not the ideal. Look, if you were to cross at um, uh, Titus chapter number two, Titus chapter number two, Paul writes and tells Titus, who is another um, young preacher, and he gives him instructions for what's supposed to be going on and, and, and how, what he's supposed to teach the young people. Look at Titus chapter number two, Titus chapter number two and verse number four, Titus chapter number two and verse number four, and this is describing what the older woman is supposed to do. It says that they may teach the young woman to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, Keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. And so notice, one of, the, one of the jobs that we see here of the old woman is to teach the younger woman. That's an important thing. They're supposed to teach the young woman. And what are they supposed to teach them? To be sober. Well, that fits in with what we saw in Proverbs 31. You know, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home. That's kind of the opposite of the who feed abide not in her house. Keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. You see, one of the jobs of a mother is to pass on wisdom to her children. To pass on wisdom to her children. Well, guess what? If you're going to pass on wisdom to your children, you need to be at home with them. You've got to be with them. Because how are you going to pass it on if, if you're not even there? Be at home with them. Teach them. Now, of course, that's something that our government doesn't want. Our government does not want women to be at home with their children, teaching them. It, what it wants, it wants to... It wants our children to go and get indoctrinated by the government. It wants them to go to some school. Not to, not to get wisdom and instruction from someone who actually loves for them, who loves them and cares for them. That's not what it wants. See, the government does not love and care for you. It doesn't. The government does not love and care for you. If it did, then it wouldn't be telling you lies. It wouldn't be out there lying to you. You see, some of the lies you tell you... They tell you lies that are, that are deliberate, and some of them are accidental just because they're pretty stupid. I mean, it can be hard to tell which is which because there are so many of them. There are so many lies that are spouted forth by the government. You sort of think, now, is this one there? Are they just saying that because they genuinely believe it and they're fooled, or are they, are they being deceptive? And sometimes it's pretty hard to tell. You see, the government, we need to realize, the government wants to be God. Now, government is a God-ordained institution. It is. God has ordained to be governments. But the purpose of them is to punish the evildoer. That's what they're for. The government wants to be God. And do you know what else the government wants? You say, because what's the relevant of this to biblical motherhood? Well, guess what? The government also wants to be your mother. The government wants to be your mother. You've heard of the nanny state? What's a nanny? That's that, a nanny is someone who's actually looking after someone else's kids for them. Is that what a nanny is? Well, guess what? That's what the government wants to be. It wants to look after everyone. It wants to look after everyone and treat them as kids. But look, don't forget... Government is a necessary evil. Government is a necessary evil. And that's why, because it's a necessary evil, it should be kept on a short leash. Government should be kept on a short leash because it's a natural thing. It's a natural thing for it to go wrong. When you realise, hey, it's going to go wrong, then you put checks and balances in place. Keep it on a leash to, 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 to stop it getting out of control. But here's the thing. At the minute, what's happened to governments around the world? They've got off the leash, haven't they? 
They've gone completely off the leash and they're running wild. And everything they touch, they're destroying. Whole countries are being destroyed by wicked governments doing ridiculous things and trying to parent grown-ups. It's ridiculous. Okay? You think about this. What wisdom does the government have? What wisdom does the government have? You know, I was looking at some articles just recently. And, you know, there are articles that are put out by all these health authorities. And one of the things they talk about, they say, look, did you know they say it's very important during this coronavirus, you know, pandemic to get your flu shot? Have you seen those things? How it's really important. Coronavirus is out there. It's really important to get your flu shot. This is a message that's being pushed by the government. Well, guess what? Did you know that if you get your flu shot, that you actually have an increased risk of contracting coronavirus? There was a study done, I think it was in 2019, I think it was, that came out, with um, military personnel in the States. And what they found is when people had the jab, when people got the flu jab, guess what? They were 36% more likely to succumb to a coronavirus. So what does that mean? You get your flu shot, you're more likely to come down with coronavirus. So that doesn't sound like a good idea, does it? It sounds like a stupid idea. You know? I mean, you think about this. I mean, there was actually another article I saw where people who get the winter flu jab, people who get the winter flu jab are actually advised to shield themselves from the coronavirus. So they say, you need to get the flu jab because the coronavirus is out there. But then this was the thing, and this was actually from, this was from the Deputy Chief Medical Officer in England, a guy called uh, Jonathan Van Tam. And this is, this is in March, March 17, 2020. And he said that if someone gets the winter flu jab, they should shield themselves, they should isolate for 12 weeks. That's what, that's what he said. How does that even make sense? If it's dangerous, I mean, here's the thing, I, I agree, that if you get the flu shot, then it's dangerous, and you should be hiding yourself, because you, you are more at risk. You know? And just think it's a coincidence that so many of the people that are being affected are people who are old. And what's the thing they like to... Old people, you've got to get the flu job. You've got to get the flu jab. Plus all the various other medications they want to stuff down people's throats. You see, a much better idea would be get out into the sunshine. Get out into the sunshine. But, of course, what does the government say? The, the government in the UK, they actually say, well, no, you don't want to get out in the sunshine. It's very important not to. They said, don't go outside. In fact, we'll send the police around. We'll harass you. You'll ch we'll chase you inside. You're, if you're sitting down in the sun, if you're sunbathing, unless you're doing your one bit of exercise, they will chase you inside. That's how crazy it is. You know? It says that, um, you know, I was reading a, an article. It says, Brits warned not to sunbathe on 26 degree bank holiday weekend as lockdown enforced. The public are being urged to stick to guidance and to take just one form of exercise per day and not to linger or gather in parks to enjoy the weather. Get inside. You know, is it any wonder that the UK has had more deaths than anywhere else in Europe? You know, don't forget, don't forget, of course, that's, isn't that where that guy's from, that um, Neil Ferguson? That's where he's from. That's the person who made the predictions of 2 million dead in the US and 500,000 dead in the UK. You know, he had his computer model and it predicted these are going to be all the deaths. You know, and people said, oh, can you show us the code? He's like, oh, well, actually, no, 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 I can't. And eventually, it was like about six or seven weeks later, a couple of months later, before he finally released it. And, we, and he put it up on GitHub, and when people looked at it, when real programmers looked at it, they thought, like, this is a joke. This guy's a clown. And yet, this is what things are based on. Things are based on this, this code, which is absolute garbage. Not only that, but the guy who put this out, and who's telling people, look, you've got to self-isolate, what's he busy doing? He's busy committing adultery with someone who lives on the other side of town. I mean, it's like, you, you wouldn't write something this crazy. This is how absurd it is. You know, where's the social distancing that's going on? Look, if you, don't get me wrong, if you want to social distance or physical distance or whatever, go for it. But don't impose that upon other people. You know, it's like, it's like vaccinations. It's like, these, it's like vaccinations. Do, do vaccinations work? Well, let me ask you this. If vaccinations work, then why do you need to force other people to do it? If vaccinations work, Get your vaccination, and you're good to go. What's the problem? But you see, there's a real tendency to force other people to vaccinate. It's not enough for, for people to say, well, I don't want to get vaccinated myself. I need to make you do it. You know? There's a tendency among small-minded people to have a burning desire to control other people. Edmund Burke said, those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it. 
Those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it. I wish more people would actually read some books. Read some history books. Read, read a book like, here's a good one to read, The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich. Read that. Read what happened. Read how Hitler came to power. Because you know how Hitler came to power? He came to power on a huge surge of popular support. That's how he came to power. There was a huge... It wasn't a, I mean, he didn't take over by himself. He didn't. Now, admittedly, he did do a few dodgy... You know, he did a lot of dodgy things. Killing people and blaming other people. Yeah, I mean, he did, I mean you name it, the whole false flag. He did all sorts of bad stuff, for sure. But, hey, don't forget. He was voted in. They voted for him. You know? He had a huge amount of people who were supporting him. You know? People were crying out for him to do what he did. He wasn't just some lone maniac. He had plenty of support. And you know, when I saw that, that, that video that was out on the, the people getting arrested over in, over in Australia, when I saw those, no, no, no offence against any former policeman, but you know, when I saw those mindless drones in Australia dragging away a mother and child because they didn't like what they said, I thought to myself, look, that's, that's sickening and that's dangerous when people blindly follow authority. It is. Because, well, I mean, what did people do in Nazi Germany? They blindly followed authority. That's what they did. They blindly followed authority. You say, look, what does that all have to do with mothers? Well, wasn't that a mother? I think it was. It was a mother and a child that was dragged. That, that's who they arrested. You know, let's get back to Proverbs chapter number 31. Proverbs chapter number 31. Let's look at verse number, verse number 11. This is describing this virtuous woman. And understand, this virtuous woman, it says her price is far above rubies. It's, it means it's very, very valuable. Very, very valuable. It says, The heart of her husband does safely trust in her, so that he should have no need of spoil. Her husband, it's like, because he's got this virtuous wife, it's like, that's a great place to be in. Her husband trusts her. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She's a, she's a blessing to him. The Bible says, Whoso findeth a wife, findeth a good thing, and obtaineth favour of the Lord. It says she seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. She's a hard worker. She's like the merchant ships. She bringeth her food from afar. You know, she goes and brings the food from wherever. Okay? She riseth also while it's yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. She considereth a field and buyeth it and the fruit of her hand with the, and with the fruit of her hands she planteth the vineyard. So she's very industrious. She works very hard. She's good with her money, handling all this sort of stuff. She girdeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms. We talked about this the other, the other week. She's not weak. She's not weak. She strength, she, she girdeth her loins with strength and strengthened her arms. It's a good thing to be strong. Now, I understand, women are not as strong as men. You know, the, the Bible says giving honour unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. It's true that the wife is weaker than the husband. And if, you're, if, you're, um, if your wife is stronger than you, then you, de you, need to, you probably do need to do something severely physical and get stronger. Okay? But look, she's not weak though. She may be the weaker vessel, but she girdeth her loins with strength and stretch her arms. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by night. She's, she's working hard. She's a very hard worker. She's not lazy. She layeth her hands to the spindle, and her hands hold the distaff. She stretcheth out her hand to the poor. Yea, she reacheth forth her hands to the needy. So what else can you say about it? She's generous. She's generous. She's not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. So notice, she, she's dressed really nice. You know, she's wearing nice, nice clothing. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. Don't miss this one. Because it's saying, well, the, the husband, he's sort of well known. He sits in the gates, sits sort of where the, the elders are and stuff like that. But what that's telling is, look, this is not a coincidence. The reason why her husband is doing well is because of his wife. That's why. That's why if you look at the qualifications for, you know, in the New Testament, you look at the qualifications for a deacon or for a pastor. Do you know it's got qualifications? It says, this is what his wife's supposed to be like. Why? Because if you've got a lousy wife, you can't be a pastor. You can't. You've got to have a godly wife in order to be a pastor. That's just a fact. Okay? And so she says, look, part of his success is based on what his wife is doing because she's so great at all the stuff she's doing around the home because she's so great at what she's doing with the family that can enable him to, to do whatever he's doing here in the gates with the elders okay she maketh fine linen and selleth it and delivereth girdles unto the merchant so in other words it's not that she can't have a business or anything but would need to be a home based one because she's supposed to be a keeper at home 
Strength and honour are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. She openeth her mouth with wisdom. Now this is the key thing. She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. Don't forget, that's what, because where did Solomon get his wisdom from? He got it from his mother. And in fact, you can look throughout the, the book of Proverbs, and you'll find over and over, people are being, you know, are being taught, learn what your father teaches you, and what your mother teaches you. You know, despise not thy mother. It says, um, the, the law of my mother, it says, talks about in Proverbs, we, it's one of those ones we sing. Um, uh, like in Proverbs 23, it talks about. And so it's, it's just an important thing we understand, that learning from our mother. Now, my, my mother's not around anymore. She, she passed away just over, just over a year ago. But there's still things that I remember that my mother taught me. My, my, my mother was a very hard worker. She was a very hard worker. She was someone who worked hard at home. When I was at home, the whole time, she, she never went out and worked at all when I was there. She was always home. You know, I'd, I'd go to school, I'd come back, she was always there. You know, she'd be providing food. She'd be, she'd be managing the house. She was, you know, she was someone who, who had time. She had love. I, I remember a lot, of, a, a lot of good qualities about her. And so, on a day like, you know, Mother's Day, as it is here in New Zealand, it's a day when we, when we remember our mothers, when we think about our mothers. Now, maybe, you know, you can't necessarily go and visit your mother. You can't necessarily, well, it depends. I mean, Jacinda says you can't, but you should really be able to. There's no reason why not. But I mean, some people can't, and my mother's not around, so I can't go, can't go and see her. But here's the thing. Whether your mother's here or whether, whether she's not, there are still ways that you can be pleasing to her. There are still ways that you can give her a present. And one of the best ways, one of the best things you can do is actually be a godly person. Be a godly person. You know? It says in Proverbs chapter 10, verse number 1, it says the Proverbs of Solomon, a wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish son is the heaviness of his mother. If you want to make your mother sad, then be an idiot. Be a foolish son. Be a bad child. That's something that's going to make your mother sad. It says in Proverbs 23, verse 22, Hearken unto thy father that begat thee, and despise not thy mother when she is old. Thy father and mother shall be glad, and she that bear thee shall rejoice. Proverbs chapter 30, verse number 17. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 17 says, The eye that mocketh at his father, and despiseth to obey his mother, the ravens of the valley shall pick it out, and the young eagles shall eat it. Beware, if you don't listen to your mother, there's bad things coming your way. There's serious bad things coming your way. It says, uh, where do we read up to? Um, verse number 26. She opened her mouth with wisdom, and her tongue is the law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. I mean, how much does this emphasize that she is not lazy? You know, a biblical example of motherhood is someone who works hard. Because guess what? It's hard work to be a mother. A lot of people have discovered when, you know, the kids have all had to not go to school and they've had to stay home. They've discovered how much work's involved with having kids around all the time. And yet that's the example. That's what's, that's what's supposed to happen. It says, um, verse number 28, Her children arise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. Why? It's a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Now when you look through Proverbs 31, you can sometimes look and think, oh, this is just an impossible standard to reach. To reach this sort of standard. But look, that's what we should be aiming for. This is not just for women. These Godly characteristics are characteristics that we should, men and women, should aim to have. These godly characteristics. And even though we don't attain them in this life, that's something we should be striving and pressing toward. Paul said, not as though I've attained, I am already made perfect. He says, but I, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high call of God in Christ Jesus. Verse number 30, favour is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. You see, something that can really show praise to a mother is her own children. There's nothing like a godly child for giving praise to the mother. You know? There's nothing, there, there's nothing that speaks so well. You know? There's nothing that's going to make your mother happy. There's nothing that's going to speak so well when you live the best life you can possibly live. The title of the sermon today is Biblical Motherhood. Biblical Motherhood. I don't know if you realise this, but did you know that did you know that God is actually a great mother? Did you know that? 
Now you think, hang on, you're going off into that heresy of, um, you know, God the Mother, the, the World Mission Society, Church of God. No, I'm not going down that path. But, you know, and I'm not saying that God is a Korean woman either, for that matter. But look, God has got some good attributes of a mother. He does. God has some good attributes of a mother. It says in Isaiah chapter 66 and verse 13, it says, As one whom his mother comforteth, so will I comfort you, and you shall be comforted in Jerusalem. Guess what? God comforts us like a mother comforts her children. Deuteronomy 20, uh, 32 verse 11 says, As an eagle stirreth up her nest, fluttereth over her young. Spreadeth abroad her wings. Notice that. Is this a daddy eagle or a mummy eagle? As an eagle stirreth up her nest, fluttereth over her young, spreadeth abroad her wings, taketh them, beareth them on her wings, so the Lord alone did lead him. And there was no strange God with him. Today is the day we look, we should give special honour to mothers. Give special honour to your mothers today. Give special honour to your mothers every day. You know? As I said, look, you know, my mother passed away. I can't go and visit her. I can't send her a present. But what I can do, I can do is honour her. I can honour her. The Bible says, Hearken unto thy father that begat thee. Despise not thy mother when she is old. Thy father and thy mother shall be glad, and she that bear thee shall rejoice when we walk in a way that pleases God. The Bible says in Proverbs 29 verse 15, The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Why would that be? Because the child left themselves, they're going to go off down the wrong path. They're going to go in a way that they shouldn't be going. And that's going to bring shame to the mother. Turn if you were to um, 3 John, last place we turn. 3 John, right towards the back of your Bible, 3 John. <clears throat> Biblical motherhood. There's many examples of mothers in the Bible. You know, starting at Eve, you can... Think of, you know, remember Hannah, the, the mother of Samuel. You can have you know, Mary, the mother of Jesus. You, know, you can think of um, Naomi, you know. Obviously, she had some, you know, her sons died in, in Moab, but she, you know, she was the mother-in-law to Ruth. You know, there's many examples we can see. There's, in fact, there's, there's examples of, of, of godly kings in the Bible. It talks about, well, this is who the mother was of that, of that, of that godly king. Look at um, 3 John, 3 John. Verse number four says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. You want to bring your mother joy, whether she's still here on this earth, whether she's not. If you want to bring joy to her, walk in the truth. Walk in the truth. That means walk in the way that God has has laid down. God has laid down. And it's right here in his word. He says, look, this is, this is the way we're supposed to behave. I will let the younger woman marry, bear children, guide the house. You know, women are supposed to be discreet, chaste, keep us at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. These things are laid down. And when people agree with that, and when they walk in that, they're walking in the truth. And that's going to bring God joy. Because God has said, this is the way that it's supposed to be. This is what? biblical motherhood is all about. It's not, it's not what the world defines as being a great mother. You see, because the world says, if you want to be a good mother, well, you only have one, maybe a couple of children, you know, and then get on birth control, go off and work a job, go and do all these other things to get yourself success. Isn't that what it's about? No. That's, that might be success in the world's eyes. That might be why the world is pushing you to do that. You know, the world doesn't encourage people to stay at home and raise families. You know? And it wasn't that long ago where it used to be normal. Didn't it used to be normal? The father would be out working, the mother would be at home looking after the children. But now the world we live in is different. The world we live in, the government is taking your children. You know? And people just think it's normal. But look, at, it's, not, it's, not a, it's not a normal thing. You know, go back, to, go back to Nazi Germany. And Alf Hitler was someone who wanted to get people's children. Give me the youth. He said, don't worry about the old people. Give me the youth. And I'll train them up. I'll train them and I'll teach them. You know, Hitler was the person who outlawed homeschooling in Germany. I think it's still outlawed to this day. He was the one who outlawed it because he didn't want people teaching their children at home. That's, that's, that's one good thing that's coming. A lot of children have gone out in there at home with their families. That's not a bad thing. That's a, that's a good thing. That is a good thing. You say, but what about me? Maybe I'm in a situation where, you know, maybe I'm, I'm past the age. Maybe I, maybe I can't have children or whatever, whatever life circumstances I'm in. Look, you might not necessarily be a, be a mother. But you know, you can have spiritual children. You can have spiritual children. 
Those same things can apply. It's a very honourable mission to raise godly children. But what about having spiritual children? You know, Paul said, you know, he talked about the people that he'd begotten through the gospel. Given birth to them. When someone gets when someone gets saved, they get born again. They become a child of God. How does that happen? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. They hear the word of God and they believe. But then again, how are they going to hear it unless someone tells them about it? The Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him and whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him and whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And that's not talking about me. That's talking about man, woman, boy, girl. How shall they preach except they be sent? It's great to raise godly children, but it's great to also raise just godly people, spiritual people. So whatever stage of life you're in, you can be a mother. You can be a godly parent. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for your word. And Lord, I just pray you'd help each one of us. Help each one of us to honour our mothers. Help us to honour the, the, the role of a mother and to realise that it is, a, it is a godly calling. It's a very, very important job. Lord, we thank you that you care for us with the care that only a, a mother really has. Lord, we thank you that you love us. We thank you that in spite of all of our, our flaws and all, all of our sins and all of our faults, we thank you that you love us. We thank you that you died on the cross for us. That you took our place. That, I mean, that was the sort of love that a, that a mother would show, giving her life for a, for a child. And you gave your life that we might have life. Lord, we thank you for that. And we thank you for mothers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.